Hey everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this year's Chef Conf Online. I am Jody Wolfborn, um, and I want to welcome, welcome you to our conversation today. Today, Benny Vasquez and I are joined by four women with very different backgrounds, different stories, and who are at different stages in their careers, um, and have all found unique ways to face the challenges that we always encounter um, as minorities in the technology industry. We will hear stories from each of the panelists about their journeys. Um, we'll take a few questions from our attendees and then we'll invite you all to join us uh, for a super fun mocktail cocktail happy hour afterwards. Um, so to get us started off, I'll introduce, uh, I'll give a little bit more of an intro to myself. Um, we'll introduce each of the panelists and then Benny will kick us off um, uh, into the actual discussion. So um, as I mentioned, my name is Jody Wolfborn. I am a senior developer relations uh, advocate here at Chef Software. Um, and basically that means I help developers and um, IT operators connect the dots between um, all the various resources available to them um, when automating the solutions that they are trying to solve for. Um, I have been involved in tech for uh, gosh, Officially, um, they've paid me to be involved in tech for about 15 years now, um, but I've always been interested in um, engineering uh, and stuff like that since I was young. So it feels like it's been a lifetime. And um, today my mocktail will be a uh, um, vodka soda with a splash of lemon. Um, so I hope you will all join us in the mocktail cocktail hour as well. Um, I, with that, I will hand it off to our first panelist and that is Brittany Woods. Brittany, take it away. Hello. Um, so my name is Brittany Woods and I'm an automation engineer at Carfax. So basically, my job is to empower others to be successful in automating the things. Um, my primary focus is chef and automation, but I also do infrastructure as code, and I act as an advocate for the DevOps. Um, I've been in tech for about eight years, maybe a little over, and um, a member of the chef community for five and a half. And uh, so my mocktail drink of choice is actually going to be a nice Swedish pear cider that does not have alcohol in it that I accidentally spent $50 on. So. Nice, okay. Um, let us move on to Stephanie Orich. Hi, I'm, my name's Stephanie Orich. I am a senior technical program manager at Amazon working in Alexa Smart Home. I help improve Alexa's understanding of the customer and all a technical program manager means is that I'm leading projects to delivery and I'm getting involved in the technical architecture. And I've, if you ask me, I've been involved with tech for 10 years. Officially, I've only been in a tech role for just under a year. Well, awesome. Um, thank you for joining us. Next up, let's have Alicia Knighton. It Sorry. looks like you're muted, Alicia. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Alicia Knight and I'm a senior professional services engineer at Chef. For me, that just means that I handle strategic customers on their chef journey on site or remotely from zero to hundred and anywhere in between. Um, I've been in the chef, uh, the tech industry for five years and my uh, drink of choice is a uh, 40 ounce of uh, green tea. My goodness, very nice, sorry. We're all having unmuting difficulties today. <laughs> um, and that brings us to Christiane. Oh my goodness, I am a Vedian. I am, did I pronounce that correctly? You got it great, great Ooh, job, okay. Jody. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Jody. Hi, Christiana Vidian. Um, I am, my pronouns are she, her, identify as a queer female executive and work with Capgemini. I am a chief relationships officer for Capgemini. So what that means is that I get to help our clients solve complex business problems um, using design thinking and fun ways to think through it. Um, I've been in the tech world for 20 years. Um, so I think I'm the the old one here. Uh, my mocktail is actually a cocktail, uh, is a combination. It's actually a drink from Marlowe restaurant in San Francisco. Uh, it's a combination of gin, 
um, homemade vermouth that my wife made, uh, a little lime juice, and some tonic water. Uh, how do I order one of those, please? <laughs> that sounds delicious. <laughs> um, thank you. And that leaves us with Benny Vasquez. Hello, I'm Benny Vasquez. I am the community manager here at Chef. I just joined Chef in uh, November. So, and I'm the first community manager, at least it was a new position when I joined. So it's kind of exciting because it's, um, I kind of get to decide what I do. What I tell folks is that I filter emotions. I take feedback from the community and uh, about our products or about how we're interacting with folks and bring it internally and then take uh, new things and communicate them out, whether it's from product or, or anything else. Um, I act as kind of an emotion filter in both directions. I have been in tech for 16 years, so I'm almost there, <laughs> not quite 20. Uh, and today my cocktail is a uh, gin and passion fruit LaCroix. So I'm super Ooh. fancy, super fancy. And this one, this panel is actually near and dear to my heart because for a ton of reasons, but primarily because the tech community as a whole and certainly chef's community as a subset of that is largely homogenized, not around people that are remotely like me. So it's been uh, one of my goals to start having these sorts of conversations and kind of trying to encourage uh, a safe space, not just for tech folks in general, but also specifically for folks that would not otherwise want to join this community. So that's kind of fun for me. One of the things that I love about our community is that we have so many authentic personalities. Brittany, I remember when we were talking about this panel beforehand, you mentioned a lot about spending time early in your career being inauthentic. Can you talk a little bit about what being inauthentic is, what it looked like in your career and um, how you, how, your story, I guess. Yeah. So while I speak as a member of the chef community now, um, and I consider myself pretty outspoken, um, and I think that I'm respected professionally now, um, it's definitely not always been that way. Um, so before I found my voice, before I became this outspoken person, um, I found myself sitting in a room with my five teammates, um, and I congratulated each of them as they stood for a promotion that I didn't receive. Um, I felt that it's okay to do the majority of a team's workload single-handedly um, without any kind of recognition um, in hopes that I would deserve or be deserving of that promotion that I was never going to receive. Um, I've been introduced to potential coworkers as Brittany, who's good at administrative tasks, um, despite me proving my skills in infrastructure as code and development. Um, and in all of this, I spent the first several years of my career without knowing how to be my authentic self because of that. I just thought this is how it is working in a professional environment. Um, you keep doing and you keep grinding and eventually it will get better. Um, but I didn't realize that these weren't normal things that you deal with. Um, and I also didn't realize that it was okay to stand up for yourself in a professional way. Um, so really for me, the turning point in all of this was actually both mental and monetary, to be quite frank. Um, because I wasn't able to be my authentic self, um, that was completely taxing on me mentally. Um, it was taxing on me emotionally, um, but also finding out that I was doing all of these things, I was grinding and I was trying to make myself better. Um, and I was still valued significantly less than my counterparts, those same people that were promoted in the room where I wasn't. Um, and it really just broke something in my spirit. Um, and that was the point where I was like, no, we have to change the situation. Um, and so in living through all of that and experiencing those things, I feel like that is what made me harness my voice and become this more outspoken, um, authentic person professionally. Um, and in all of that, I also learned that those things aren't okay. They're absolutely not okay. And there's somewhere out there that won't do that to you. Um, and 
also in that I learned that individuals can really, um, can really be great. Um, but you can still experience hardship and that doesn't have anything to do with the individuals around you because I certainly had people that, um, I looked up to in the role that I experienced these things in. I certainly had people that I considered a friend and I still am friends with him today. Um, but that didn't make this experience any less. Um, but so now coming through all of that, I feel like I'm in this better place mentally and emotionally because I feel respected and I feel like I can speak out and be my authentic self. Yeah, I, I really like that you were able to um, kind of, I mean, I don't like that it was sort of hitting rock bottom that made you um, like discover your voice, but I really like that you um, found this place where you sort of had to transform yourself. Um, and like, really, you're just transforming yourself back into what you actually were to begin with. Um, but once you were able to recognize that, you you were like, I, <laughs> I've personally been able to witness like the, tra the trajectory trajectory of your career since the moment you were able to embrace yourself and like um, speak up for your own voice. And it's been amazing um, to, to be able to watch. So um, yeah, congratulations and good job. Um, and that also, um, Stephanie, that also kind of reminds me um, of some elements of the, of the um, sort of discussion that we had leading up to this, um, where it, it felt like, um, you really had, you really know your voice very well and you had really identified it um, kind of going into your career, but um, you, you sort of talked about having to discover how to make other people hear and respect your voice as well. Can you, um, can you talk a little bit about that and share with us um, your story behind that and how you sort of accomplished that? Yes, so my bachelor's degree is actually in finance. And I remember when I first started my career, I actually chose to be the IT financial analyst. And I will never forget my first meeting with IT senior leadership. We were reviewing a document that I had written and they were acting like I didn't even exist and I wasn't even in the room. All of the questions were directed towards my boss. Even if I answered their questions, they waited until my boss actually repeated it to listen which taught me something. It taught me that sometimes you have to be the smartest person that's in the room. You have to be the most prepared. And from there on out, I decided that I would be the person who was most familiar with my projects and the topics that were being discussed at meetings, but also identifying that it wasn't just about what I was saying, but also what I was choosing not to say and identifying how to lead a discussion without overtaking it being able to jump in on key points of conversations when my words would be the most impactful. But then in my next rotation, I joined the international team. And at the time they were expanding their small team and it was really hard to get IT resources assigned to our project. So I decided to go to my good friend, Google and teach myself SQL and visual basics and automate our reporting and our processes myself. And that's when I really learned that I love this hybrid type of role that spans across finance and IT. But also a key part of my success was my new boss at the time who had allowed me to experiment and supported me in ta into taking matters into my own hands. And that's when I, I realized not only did I have this niche, but I was able to do what I wanted to in roles, no matter what I was hired to do and no matter what my title was, I made my position what I wanted it to be. And having that self-awareness is super powerful because when you're lucky enough to have a great boss at the beginning of your career and you know what you want to do, you can, the sky's the limit, right? And so I followed him into different roles, into new companies. Um, unfortunately, a few years ago, I was not as lucky to have such a great boss. And I had moved into a business intelligent role for a very brief period because I was so unhappy. My new boss wanted to not just put me in a box, but shove me in a corner, hide me there. And it was the only time in my career I could ever remember crying. I had never imagined having to work or deal with someone 
who would talk down to me, yell at me for voicing my opinion, threaten to fire me if I continued to do so. It didn't take very long before I went back to that great boss. I told him what was going on. And not only did he create a brand new position for me, he allowed me to choose my title and write my own job description. And writing your own job description is very empowering. It's amazing. But I would not have been able to do that if I didn't have that self-awareness about what I wanted out of my career. And if I had not found my passion to solve these complex technical challenges. Coming out of that, I realized that not everyone has that self-awareness and they're not able to do that self-analysis to say, okay, this is what I'm really good at and this is what I really enjoy doing. So as I work with people, I try to point out, hey, did you know you're really good at this? Um, I've also signed up for mentorships, help other people recognize their own talents. And it's just something that I feel really passionate about having been through this in my career as well. And if I hadn't had this self-awareness or this great boss who helped me identify these key talents that I had, I would would not be where I am today or have been able to make the jump from finance to IT or tech. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, yeah, I think you bring up an excellent point of like recognizing the people around you who can help you um, and who do support you. Um, and like, I don't want to say use them because that sounds like such a negative word, but like really lean into those relationships and allow them to support you if they're offering to support you. Um, don't feel guilty about like accepting resources or connections that offer themselves to you. Um, that's yeah, that <laughs> very, very good point. Um, you also, um, you also kind of talked a little bit about like um, understanding the situation and being the most prepared person in the room. And like <laughs> um, when we were preparing for the panel, I remember you um, at some point were describing how you prep for something and talking about like binders and journals. And, like, just, um, <laughs> it struck a chord with me because I am very much the opposite. Um, but it also kind of relates to Alicia's story um, where she, uh, um, I remember Alicia, you were saying you, um, you were sort of able to like dig in um, and, and try to figure out what the problem was before you launched into solving it. Um, and so can you, yeah, can you share with us your story? Um, sh um, talk about like, um, like why you learned you had to do that. Um, yeah, share with us your lessons. <laughs> well, let me take a big gulp of this because it's a woo cha moment. So for me, it was read the logs, read the logs, read the logs, read the logs. Alicia, did you read the logs? Alicia, um, did you read the logs? And, and that came from, um, when I, when I first started, my background is in biology and physics. And at the time, a company by the name of CSC gave me a, a shot. They're like, oh, you smile, you speak well, and hey, you know physics, so you can figure this stuff out. So um, that's how I, I walked into being a systems engineer. And when I walked into being a systems engineer, um, well, no one told me that life was not going to be as easy as, hey, you got the job. Um, instead, I, I found myself being in situations where I'm saying, hey, I know the answer to these things. And I was on a team of 35 men and they would look at me and then they would keep brainstorming, keep brainstorming until 45 minutes into it. Someone says the thing that I just literally said. It was driving me insane. Um, outside of that, um, as Brittany ind indicated um, in her story, I showed the same situation where, oh, well, she can do the the system administrative task. Oh, she can, she's great at technical writing. She can do configuration management. I didn't want to do that. I want to do some cool stuff. So, so I left there and um, I went to an IOT company. And when I went to the IOT company, they, they knew I had a little bit of Windows background, but I didn't have any Linux background. And so um, they threw me at this IBM contract and installing IBM software, if you're familiar, is interesting for me. Um, and so every time I run into something, I would say, hey, um, I'm running into this and I run into that. And they would say, hey, did you read the logs? 
Yeah, but then I ran and said, okay, well, did you read the locks? Um, did you, well, how about you go and look at this and that? And then I started reading the Google and reading the logs. And then I, I learned that as you read the logs, um, it's a bunch of jargon and then it's actual factual information. And you can take a piece of something and turn that into something else. And from reading the logs, I learned that being uncomfortable, you become comfortable. Um, you go from not knowing what's going on to determining what's going on, to building your solution, to building um, sort of like building a network, to building a network or even a knowledge base of these things work this way or, oh, it doesn't work that way. So let's figure out how it works. Um, and from there, I learned how to feel confidence in myself. I learned how to say, okay, let me take the hard problems. Um, I, I recall there's a time, uh, ticket 79. So JIRA has tickets in order and there's a legendary uh, ticket 79. I, I moved to DC and I, I worked for um, a government contractor and I went in there and they said, hey, we have this ticket 79. Um, this particular, particular application can't go out. Um, our VP, of engineering has went out and has participated in this ticket. This ticket is not doable. We're gonna give it to you um, because you seem eager and you seem like you will probably fail at it, but you will smile about it kind of deal. Um, so legendary ticket 79 went from, I don't know any components of this ticket to breaking this ticket down to, oh man, shit, this isn't working. Oh, I just blew this up too. One day it started clicking. Oh, well, I've done all of these things. So let me do this and let me do this. And so I, I kept being persistent until those things that were failures, I turned them into actual solutions. And ticket 79 was complete. And then ticket 79 became ticket 301. And 301 was all the things needed for development. And then that actually, then I was actually able to bring them all the way to production single-handedly which for me was great in itself just because, hey, I went in there and had no idea what was going on. And I stood up for myself and said, I don't know, I don't know, now I know, now I know. Um, and, and for me, that, that became a, a positive experience that I, that I bring on to my current job. Um, and at my current job, um, I'm not just saying this because this is a shift conference, but at my current job, in my current role, I'm surrounded by great people that I can reach out to. Um, and I can reach out to, to them so much that I, I work with great people that I try to emulate. And um, I have one-on-ones with them. I, I try to take the good qualities that they have um, and I make them into my, my, my own. That way, as I grow, I, I become like a, a super Alicia, so to speak. And because of that, I always fine tune who I will become. I mean, today I am a senior uh, senior member of the PS team. Tomorrow I may wanna own an ice cream shop. The day after that, I may wanna be a yoga instructor or you know, I may wanna do like go-go fitness or something. I don't know. But for me, I've learned that there's no ceilings. You can be who you wanna be. You should be comfortable. I have nose rings, my hair is crazy, and I really don't care what people think. I'm just myself. And that's what I've learned. And that's that's what I that's who I enjoy being. My my best self. I love that. Um, for the record, please don't leave technology <laughs> ever. Uh, I mean, do what you want. If you want to open an ice cream shop, please do that. And I will happily shop there, but don't leave us here. <laughs> we'll be there. <laughs> we'll come have some ice cream. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so far, everyone's story has had like a really nice, uh, almost curated theme of growth um, and sort of self-learning um, and, um, and uh, of being able to kind of hunker down when conditions might not be super ideal, um, which I'm sure we can all imagine um, 
if not some point in our career, some point in our lives or in the life of the whatever region we're from where things might not be, um, where conditions might not be ideal. Um, and uh, the theme really is of being able to hunker down in those conditions and grow despite a lack of resources um, or to be able to like identify and seek out the, the few resources that are available um, and try to nurture them and grow them. And so um, it's definitely a very um, personal problem, but it's also um, something that needs to be solved at an organizational level. And I think, Christiane, that is where a lot of the work you've done um, at Capgemini and at other, other uh, positions before that um, that that goes back to a lot of the work that you've done and um, where that work comes into play. So um, can you kind of uh, close out this portion of like our pre-planned questions? Um, can you close it out with um, some, some of your story and um, some of the lessons that you learned that we can take away and apply um, at, a, at a broader spectrum to start um, not just helping people grow, but maybe start healing some things that are pretty broken. Sure, happy to, thanks Jody. And I just say it's it's such an honor to be on this panel with this great group of women that I wish um, 20 years ago, I had heard your voices of finding your voice, finding, writing your own resume, uh, all of that. It's, it's very inspiring to be part of it. Um, so. Over the 20 years I've been in tech, I can't even count the number of jobs I've had, but I, I culminate that experience into two, two areas. The first being um, global um, uh, partnerships and strategic alliances, where I worked with Capgemini and Microsoft and, and grew a book of business to $1.3 billion. Learned a lot in that uh, period mostly in the tech world, a lot of, of male dominated areas where I learned it, needed to find my voice and um, really push an agenda where folks were not directly reporting to me. Um, so I had to find a way of, of growing that business in a new way. And the other part of my experience is in what I would call human centered design. Um, so using things like design thinking and uh, creative ways of working, collaborative ways of working to help solve business problems. And those worlds are pretty different. Um, but what I found kind of my big aha moment was the culmination of those worlds. And Alicia talks about doing all these different jobs and opening an ice cream um, shop. The thing that's really cool is the, the combining of all of our knowledge that is our secret sauce, right? Whatever that is for each of us as individuals is looking at that experience and history that we have, what makes us unique at the table. And that is where that's, that's the gold. And once you recognize that about yourself, you feel so much more empowered. You feel so much more, um, qualified, you've, you're able to really kind of come and, and step it at the table in a new way. So that's been exciting for me. Um, diversity is very much part of my DNA. Um, I, as I said in the beginning, I identify as a, as a queer female executive. It's, uh, I've always been part of women's groups where they have existed and where they haven't existed, I've created them or, or started my own. Uh, it's important, it has been important for me to find my tribe and find my community to help move efforts along within the organizations that I've been in. Um, in 2007, I recognized that I was not bringing my, my full authentic self to work and that I wasn't actually out within the organization. And so I went to HR at the time and said, hey, I want to start an LGBT group and had to have a conversation with legal first about what does that mean and went through a couple hoops and um, a year later had something started. I think we had 20 or so folks in North America and 13 years later, I'm super proud that what started out as one, we didn't even call it an employee resource group at the time. We just called it kind of a group. What started out as the first employee resource group has grown to 11 resource groups within Capgemini globally. And I'm currently the exec sponsor for our global Outfront team. We have 5,000 members and are in 14 countries. 
Um, and part of the excitement about that has been watching the milestones along the way. And the, some of those milestones are things that I never would have imagined would have happened. And so it's been part, it's been proud. I've been proud to be part of the journey and, and the evolution. Um, DNA, as I, or DNI is very much into my DNA. It's the way that I hire folks. It's the way I staff projects. It's the way that I work with our clients um, and make sure that we are aligned in what uh, our values are as an organization. Um, and so, you know, today, June, June 3rd, June 3rd uh, it's Pride Month. And so while I am proud of Pride and happy to say that, I'm also very conscious at this time, um, it's been hard for me to be on social media saying happy Pride given what is going on in the world. And so I just have to say, you know, I, in solidarity, so much um, honor, respect, and togetherness with our Black and Indigenous people of, of color at this time. And I'm sorry, I got a little, a little choked up, but it's a really hard time for all of us. And so it's a big part of diversity. And um, one of the keys for me has been finding those intersections of diversity. So right now, and in, in we, had a, we had a call, um, what is today, Wednesday? We had a call Monday uh, with our team about trying to craft our social media messaging to collaborate between our LGBT group and our people of color group to make sure that we're creating the right messaging and platform in the world. Um, so those intersections are super powerful to me because they're the way that you can bring allies along the journey. They're the way that you can grow your platform, create awareness and really grow, grow your efforts. Um, so a couple of things in terms of the organizational stance that I have found to be important it's number one, um, understand your landscape. And this is a, a constantly moving dial in terms of what diversity is and what the needs are for your organization. Um, understanding what the needs are of, let's call it the user or your community. And as the landscape shifts, being able to evolve on those things. And I guess the second thing would be, while you're doing that, also have your North Star in mind like know what your goals are, even if those are two to three things, let's face it, a lot of times diversity are things that we do as our hobbies in our jobs, right? And so finding those two to three things every year that your group is going to move the dial forward on so that in the end, you can actually celebrate those milestones and successes is really important. Um, and really what I'll close with, I think there's three things that I found are super important when it comes to diversity and, and the way that I've grown. Number one, it's, it's having the right executive sponsorship or, or mentorship and, and individually finding mentors for, for each of us. I still have some of the same mentors that I had uh, when I first started my career. And then Stephanie, to your point, one of the best bosses I ever had told me, you are the smartest person in the room with your content. And if you know that, it does put you in a super powerful position. So I would encourage us all to know, nobody knows our content like we do and own that when you walk into a room or into a meeting. So that executive sponsorship and mentorship is important. Um, secondly, it's, it's uh, again, understand those two to three things that you wanna do to move the dial, keep, the, keep them on track, keep them moving. Um, and third, celebrate the milestones. Uh, diversity and all of these areas is a journey that each of us go on. Sometimes you have to be patient and sometimes it's more about the journey than the destination, but you will be better and wiser because of the ride that you're on. Awesome, thank you. Um, you, the... <laughs> There are so many points that you brought up that everybody has brought up. Um, I I want to ask kind of personally and selfishly, um, it, in your um, in your career, you said you sort of had to start the ER the employee resource groups yourself. Um, can you offer advice? Um, and then also, Benny, as our community manager, can you maybe follow up um, with your your response on this and, as well? But um, 
for those of us out there or for, for people who are out there who um, the employee resource groups don't exist yet and maybe the executive sponsorship doesn't exist yet, mm -hmm. um, do you have tips on starting those resource groups yourself? Yeah, it, there definitely is a maturity curve on what an employee resource group looks like. And sometimes the beginning, it's literally grassroots. It's literally finding your people, finding your tribe, finding the people who are passionate about a cause with you. And that could be anything from LGBTQ to, um, I don't know, I like to plant things, I, anything, right? It could be whatever diversity is for you. So you, you find your tribe of, of common followers. Um, Sometimes you know who those folks are. Sometimes you don't know who those folks are. But starting, we started with three people and three people grew. Um, so it's really kind of finding those people. Then it's going to leadership and having the conversation. We want to start this group. Is there an existing platform or framework that exists that we can build upon? Sometimes there isn't, sometimes there's not. Um, sometimes HR is willing to take that forward which is okay, um, but to me, it's also been important to not just rely on the HR venue, but also find the business sponsorship for your employee resource group, right? You need to have somebody in a line of business who cares about your cause, because that's where you're gonna get your funding, that's where you're gonna get executive support, and that's where you get to do some really cool things like working with clients or, or even what you guys are doing here, hosting this with an external audience. Um, so, you know, I'd say it can be both grassroots bottoms up. That's usually how a lot of these start. It can also be tops down, but tops down is, let's face it, it's just a check the box thing, right? So you, to me, the sweet spot is where those two meet um, and you get the power of a community group and you get the power of leadership and sponsorship to really move move things forward. I like that. Um, and it kind of goes back to what Alicia was saying about um, like identifying the, the mentors or like people that you want, that you like the aspects of their personalities or characteristics and emulating those. Um, Benny, sorry, <laughs> please answer. I didn't mean no to- No worries. You. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, Christiane actually covered basically everything. The only thing I might add to that is uh, there will be times when commitment waxes and wanes and that is okay. Like you have to, you have to, even in, inside yourself, you have to respect that sometimes you're going to be super fucking excited about it and sometimes you are not and that is okay. It's going to be true for everybody that joins. You're also going to get different levels of commitment from people and there'll be different expectations. And as soon as they walk into the room, they're gonna say, okay, where's my sign? I wanna make a sign, I wanna make a sign, I wanna do it right now. And then you'll get somebody else that walks in that says, I've got 15 minutes to give you and then I gotta go because I gotta go get my kid or I gotta, you know, it doesn't matter, right? They have to walk out the door. So uh, that's the only thing I think I could add to Kissian's answer is you gotta, you gotta be respectful of that. I like that. I have an issue with being patient. Um, so I'll try to remind myself. Not of that. my Jody. <laughs> Nobody knows that about me. I'm sure it's not <laughs> <No>. obvious. <laughs> um, and thank you, Mindy, for posting in the chat here um, a question from the Evia platform from Amelia Aronson, I believe is how that is pronounced. Um, yeah. Uh, are there any recommended resources like books, websites, or online groups that kind of already exist that you would recommend for other women in tech? Um, and also resources that give other people who want, uh, who want to understand the challenges. So maybe resources for allies out there as well. Um, I, uh, yeah, does, I have a couple, um, but maybe I can start it off while other people are thinking about their responses to that, or if someone else has one off the top of their head, uh, go for it. Um, uh, I have a few books or authors that um, help me at the very least. Um, Brené Brown is one of them. Um, all, all of her books, they're not necessarily tech, um, 
tech focused, um, but they do help uh, reshape the way a lot of um, women were raised to think about themselves. Um, and so it helps a lot um, in your career. And going back to like what Stephanie said, being able to build your own resume by being self-aware of your, your strengths and identifying like what you enjoy doing. Um, uh, ooh, one of our attendees um, said Untamed by Glennon Doyle is a good recommendation. Um, and I will kind of open the floor to our panelists here if anybody else has any um, recommendations as well. I'll, I'll throw a couple out there. Um, so Women2.0 yeah. is a pretty good website um, and has a good mailing list of um, updates on articles, job postings, uh, event, local events when, when we used to do those. Um, and, uh, so they're pretty good. Um, the other thing th that I would recommend is, um, so for me, I'm, it's again, back to that intersection. So it's the women and then whatever intersection you're in. And so there's a women in design thinking group that I'm a part of. And so I find that super powerful for me. Um, but I would encourage you again to look at what the specific intersection is, if it's coding, if it's developing, you know, what your area is that you're looking to grow. And there's also a mention in the chat of Brene Brown, and I am absolutely going to back that one. Uh, she might not be great necessarily for specific, uh, or at least what my experience with what she's done hasn't been specific for like groups and that kind of stuff trying to trying to bring that out, but she is great for communication and starting like, because one of the things that I guess neither Kirsten or I really touched on is that these groups are going to or require some very difficult conversations and that's okay too. Um, getting through those conversations in productive ways can be very hard and Brene Brown stuff can definitely help with that for sure. So Anything for me, I don't, oh, sorry. Um, for me, like, I don't necessarily have books that I would recommend, but I try to not really surround myself physically, but surround myself like on Twitter or in other places with powerful women who I can look up to. Um, powerful women who have done things in their career that I would like to do in mine um, because it kind of helps you get out of that like bottom bottom mentality of I can't or I shouldn't or maybe I'm not supposed to because you see these, for lack of a better phrase, boss bitches around and you're like, hey, I want to be one of those. So I found that incredibly helpful to like both my mental state and like where I want my career to go is just seek that out. It's totally acceptable. They don't have to be um, in any positions of power, even just people you look up to that, um, really drive you forward. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's actually kind of directly relational to what Alicia was talking about, where she finds people with qualities she wants to emulate. It's the same thing when you are watching things that are the people that you want to become, you're going to start picking up on those traits. That's really cool. We have another question from the audience. Um, we'll do, where'd it go? There it is. Across your individual journeys, have any of the panelists come across positive male voices who have encouraged or helped in some way? And is there some characteristic or example about them that you'd be willing to share that could help organizations or individuals default to nurturing underrepresented peoples? I, oh, sorry, Alicia, go ahead. Go Jump right in. <laughs> yeah, Jody, if you like. I was just gonna say, I um, at first I was like, not super appreciative of the question, but then in the end, I love this question because it actually frames it in a way, um, what is the quality that, that you look for in a person who, who is a good ally? So I, I really like this question, thank you. <laughs> um, Alicia, that's all I wanted to say, go for it. Okay, so all of my mentors are male for the most part. And that's primarily because, um, Actually, it's primarily because all of the most, I wouldn't say all, but most of the females that um, I found to start off to be mentors, 
it would get to a point where they would have this ceiling thing where they would say, oh, you should do these things to go up. And then like, there's a point where they're just like, oh, well, you know, it's because you're female. And I'm like, well, chick, didn't we just have this discussion about why this shit is not, you shouldn't do it that way. But that's a whole other thing. So all of the males um, that I, the qualities that I find in them, they're willing to talk and they're willing to talk on a, on a personal level, meaning outside of, uh, outside of work or in, in front of people, you can, they're, they have an open door policy and they, they want to see you do well outside of the thing that you're doing. So outside of just, all right, if, if it's your boss, outside of your actual work, they, they're going to ask you questions like where, where do you want your journey to go? Even if it's not here, you know, it's, it's normally a mutualistic thing is normally um, non-beneficial to them and they are always open. That's what I've learned. Yeah, I like that. Um, so the oh, boss sorry. that I spoke about earlier, the great boss who helped me in my career was actually a male. And my current boss is a male too. And they've both been inspiring great people during my journey. And the best part about it is that they don't feel like bosses. They feel like my friend. I'm comfortable, like if we're out on work trips, like going out to dinner or having a drink with them. And like, it doesn't feel like you're sitting next to your boss and you're uncomfortable. It's completely normal conversation. And the other thing was that they focused more on my journey and what is it that you want? And even sometimes pushing me when like I knew what I wanted within the next year, but they're making me focus on five years forward and 10 years forward. Like you could be the next CIO if you wanted to, how do we get you there? And my current boss even jokes about him reporting to me one day. So there's, there's a lot of the encouragement, but also you also have to seem like a human being, right? You have to seem like someone I'm comfortable enough going to and talking to about things rather than this boss that I'm, scared to talk to. The, uh, the good friend that I talked about before, um, who I'm still friends with, actually, um, I think one of his main qualities was, like you said, that pushing forward, that that voice when I was at the bottom and there were no other voices and I didn't have anyone that was telling me this is wrong, um, was saying this is not right. But he was also willing to use his voice because he recognized, and I think this is important too, recognizing that either explicitly or implicitly, you have a privilege that I may not have, and I have a privilege that someone else may not have. And he was willing to use that voice that he had that I did not to advocate for me in a situation that I didn't even know to advocate for myself. Um, so I think that's incredibly important of a quality to have. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I'm gonna throw one in here because my one of my bosses honestly proved to me that male bosses aren't always terrible. Um, there was a moment where I was trying to sign us up for a conference in a country that typically has really uh, difficult views towards women. And his reaction was, I said, I want to, I want us to go to this conference. This is why it makes sense. Yada, yada, yada. And he said, he immediately responded with, well, we can't send any women. And I gave myself a moment. We continued on with the conversation about the conference. And then he stopped the conversation and said to me, was that misogynistic? And I said, yes. <laughs> the the best part about that specific moment is is honestly it's twofold one is he was willing to ask the question which is so so difficult because most bosses are are not willing to be that vulnerable with somebody that reports reports to them and the second one was when i said yes that's misogynistic because it is limiting uh access to something that could further my career if I'm not allowed to attend this conference, if you only give it to the dudes, because the, then they get to go speak at this conference or they get to go represent the company, then they get that step forward. And he said, but I, I don't, I don't want anybody to get raped. And I said, that is life. Also, we get to make that an informed decision. 
we are grown adults with all of the context. We know the risks. We can walk into that situation with our eyes open and make the decision for ourselves. That you don't have to protect us because we're grownups. <laughs> and the fact that he was uh, willing to be vulnerable and then willing to completely adjust his perspective and her, his opinion on the situation is so rare, especially in dude bosses. And it made me really happy. I, yeah. I think um, to round that out, in an industry dominated by men, it's hard not to have allies who are men. So yes, um, the qualities that that like kind of shine through in allies are um, people who want to help other people grow, um, who who aren't necessarily like looking to um, benefit themselves just through your growth. Um, so. Cool. We have a few questions from Evia as well, and we're kind of getting close to the start of mocktail hour, um, where we will actually be hopping on um, a Zoom with all of our participants. Um, and uh, I believe that means video will be enabled. So um, our participants will actually be able to like interact um, with us during the happy hour. So I just wanted to um, give us a nine minute warning. Um, and uh, I, I, there are a couple of questions in the Evia chat or in the platform chat that are um, really uh, very close to one of the ones that Benny and I really wanted to ask our panelists. So um, Charles Williams and actually Eric Bixler has kind of a similar format of this question, but um, the question is, uh, are there any suggestions for getting young girls into IT? Um, and along those lines, are there any programs or avenues that are designed for getting um, self-employed college or high school age women into tech? Um, I think I will start out um, first by saying um, encourage young girls to to be interested in different engineering things and they will be um, and that is uh, <laughs> the reason that I am interested in technology is because people who were in technology talked to me about it when I was a kid and got me interested in it so um, I think it's very similar for young boys uh, <laughs> but but yeah um, for me at the very least um, it is sh like invest in talking to them about technology, invest in showing how excited you are about what you are working on um, or the solutions that you're, you're coming up with. Um, and I will let uh, the panelists also answer that question as well. So I'm from the middle of nowhere, Louisiana, like really middle of nowhere. If I told you, you would know it's fringe from mosquito, but it's in the middle of nowhere. And so for me, there's not really that many people in general. There's, and if you start teetering through like how many people have graduated this or have done this or are doing that, it's not that many. And a lot of people move away. So um, in the small town, um, I, I'm old school. I community outreach. I go to the churches. I, I go to the schools. I talk to people and I say things like, hey, um, have you heard about doing this? What are you interested in today? Okay, you're interested in makeup. Do you know we can, um, what is your problem with makeup today? Let's have a, let's create a solution for that via IT. Like to me, the easiest thing is to start a conversation that they're familiar with and then expand on that. And you would be surprised of what they think about or how they want to think about something else or just getting them to turn the wheels of thinking. Um, because I, I personally feel, um, as you said, Jody, um, you have to start that conversation. There's so many things that you can possibly do in this space that people are really unaware of. And there's so many things that can organically grow from just learning something new anyway. So that's my take on it. I'll just add to that. I think um, one way to do that is to find, find a role model uh, that one of these girls would wanna follow be brave, reach out to them, see if they'll be willing to have a conversation with your, your daughter, niece, young, young, young girl. Um, or, and if it's not that role model, 
find someone else who can mentor and guide in a conversation and just explore the opportunity. I think similarly along those lines, like get rid of the that's for boys rhetoric um, everywhere. Like it's not needed in tech. It's not needed anywhere. Like growing up for me, I have a sister and that's it. It was me and my sister. There were no boys in the house except my dad, but there was never that that's for boys. Like if I wanted to play basketball or soccer or football, it didn't matter. I could play them. And that kind of extended on to education was really big in my house. It was always, you need to be educated. Um, so that really led me to what do I enjoy? I enjoy computers. And so there was never that thing in my head that was like, well, that's a male dominated field. I can't do that because growing up, if I wanted to play football, like, sure, there was, you're going to get hurt, but it was not, that's for boys. Um, so I think getting rid of that rhetoric early is super important as well. Unless anybody else wants to add something to there, I think we're going to do one more question and then we'll switch to, well, we'll let everybody go and then we'll switch to the new Zoom where we get to actually interact with folks that is also not broadcasted and not recorded, just so we're super clear about that. Um, I'm going to destroy this name. Anagreth. Anna. I'm not going to try it. She's no success organization in Amina. No. She said, thanks for sharing your experiences. They're very inspirational. What energizes you about your career? And how do you pick yourself back up after a drawback at work? OK, I'll start. What energizes yeah my career okay first of all I'm always energized but I'm always learning like I like that every day it's something new I'm not sitting there I know exactly what I'm going to do I know exactly what problem I'm going to solve I, I really like that I like that every day is a learning experience I like that it's okay to fail and use that failure to do something else with it I like that there are people around me that share the same thought process. And sometimes they don't. And that's even more interesting when they don't. Now I get to do the rebuttal thing that my parents absolutely hate. So I, I, I like that too. Um, and how do I pick myself up? Well, um, there's there's three things I do. So the first thing I do, I, I, I kind of do like a little reflection period where I look and see, okay, these are things I could have done better. Um, this is where I'm at and how do I move forward? So that's the first thing I do um, after a drawback. And then I, I look at all the positive things that happen outside the scope of that drawback. And then I use all that to spring forward. I love that. For, for me in my example where I was crying after a conversation with my boss, I just kind of stopped myself and asked myself, what are you going to do about this? Like as much as it hurt and as much as it sucked, like I, it just had to come to that realization that it wasn't going to change unless I did something about it. So then having the self-reflection period is perfect. Like I completely agree. Like you have to be able to acknowledge what's going on and then how to change it. Yeah, very much on the same front, like, um, I think it's important to look at a situation and see what you're going to do about it, which is something I'm still learning, but um, what can I do about this? Um, and if it's not something you can do anything about, let it go, first of all. But second of all, um, look at yourself in the mirror and just be like, I'm a boss. Like that's sometimes what I have to do or sometimes what my wife has to do and be like, you're a boss and you are the best at what you are doing. And you have done everything you can. And that will pick you right back up, I promise. <laughs> I think, um, yes. <laughs> so we have one minute left. I'm going to wrap it up. And that was, I think, a very good place to wrap it on how you kind of pick yourself back up. Um, one last tip is I um, seek out the smiling faces uh, that are already kind of around me, um, including Anna, who asked this question. Um, so yeah, you're part of the solution, Anna. Good job. Um, 
Uh, I think Benny has some words that she wants to say to wrap it up. I do have I'm some words. Spots. <laughs> oh, good. I have so many words. I, words are what I do, man. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank everybody for your time and your attention for something that seems so relatively small in the grand scheme of everything. Uh, we're going to keep the conversation going, like we said, in the mocktail slash cocktail hour uh, the, the link that Mindy has shared both in the Zoom chat and in the Evia platform. If you didn't get it, you can join our community Slack and we'll make sure that you get it there. Uh, if you aren't already a member there, you can follow the link on community.chef.io and that'll get you all registered and uh, get you joined in. We're planning to continue these chats too with the next one currently planned for September. So keep your eyes out for that and make sure you stick around for tonight's chef concert. We've got Reggie Watts and Mark Broussard and Seattle's own deep sea diver will perform just for the, just for, blah, 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 just for the chef community. Um, it's been great having you all. I'm so excited. This was awesome. Just like you are all. Uh, yeah. I guess that's it. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks, everybody.